use of land. But the difference with this law may be, for example, your zoning laws say what you pretty much can't do with your land, whereas a buffer bill tells you what you must do on that 16-foot strip. So yes, I agree, too, that there, there may be some legislation to offer compensation. I think I need to drop a bill to at least uh, lower the property tax or have the state pay the property tax on that ground. But uh, yeah, that's an area that uh, is going to be looked at and probably challenged uh, when these timelines begin to be taken. And also, um, I'm dropping a bill that would give the authority to the Soil Water Conservation District of the county to approve the final mapping. Um, and if that don't go through, I have another bill prepared that it would have to be approved by the state legislator so the DNR doesn't run wild. So I'm dropping at least the first bill see if we can get that through. <laughs> yeah, Bruce Bresky, Starbucks. And I just want to say, most of these counties out here get somewhere between 10 and $15 million in egg payments. That's for crop insurance and other things. If you look at what they pay for federal income taxes, and this is all federal money, it's usually around $6 million, about half, about half of what they're, what they're getting. So a lot of money from outside of this part of the world is going into these counties. And I don't think that asking for do something. Now, I don't know if the buffer law is the right thing, but I don't think it's unreasonable to ask for something to happen to try and make it so we can drink our groundwater and not have to get it treated or buy it. Thank you for those comments. Sir. Sure. Me? Yeah. Yeah. I'm John from Grand County. A quick question about the law. I agree with you. An agreement is an agreement. I also think that you don't make laws just to make laws. So I'm wondering if there's any kind of metric involved. You, you made this law to help us um, depollute our water. Is there any mechanism to monitor and say, hey, we're doing a great job, or this isn't working, and we need to relook at the agreement? Any kind of metric saying, when we do this, we expect this much um, you know, John, what I, would, what I would say the metric is, is is we put it with the SWCDs to work with the local producers on uh, implementing the law and on the practices on the land with the thought that they would come back to Bowser to us to let us know how it's working. We tried to get it on the ground. That was the $22 million of ongoing funding for SWCDs so they could work with producers and understand. Because the experience we have, we actually have six counties in Minnesota that already have a 50-foot buffer on all their, that was the governor's original deal. We're not proposing that, that's not the law. But we have six counties that have implemented it voluntarily and we're trying to learn from them what practices Practice did they one. use and what lessons can we learn from them. Um, and I think that's a, a great point. Um, and I don't know that we put enough metrics in it. That's that's a valid point. So the uh, second, quickly. So the SW, so the soil and water they're doing the monitoring of the water. So I would talk to them about that. Well, it depends what you're talking about monitoring. Monitoring of water as far as drinking water follow, falls under MPCA. Um, uh, there's some other water that falls under DNR. Um, so different state agencies have authorities around water. Bowser has water. Authority around water. The SWCDs would not be doing a lot of monitoring, I don't believe. Okay, thank you. There's somebody over here, Johnson. Uh, Todd Johnson, uh, District One Commissioner in Travis County. Um, this kind of fits with the buffer strip effort right now. 26 years ago, Lake Travers was in paired waters, as is about two thirds of the water in Minnesota right now. And that lake, for the most part, died. And we worked with uh, initially. Clean Lake Water Partnership Program out of ECA and went from a lake that uh, was totally degraded, dead, to now the number one, one of the number one walleye lakes has been an improvement in water quality. From 90 to 96 was uh, an improvement effort that involved the Boise Watershed, the local SWCD, and it was because there was that local control of getting things to a better place that we got results and area landowners were comfortable working with the local watershed and the SWCD and it's my understanding as commission uh, we've approved a, a full-time position to help with this buffer strip initiative that the SWCD will 
will be the agency that sees that you're uh, in compliance and ways to be compliant and and there are alternative ways um, so I think I think there's a really uh, a really good opportunity here to improve water quality for the region uh, it's a shared resource and it results in positive economic things um, uh, since the Lake Improvement Project, prior to, there were 10, 10 resorts and three supper clubs that all went out of business in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. And it was because of degrading water quality, degrading fisheries, degrading loss of tourism, loss of activity. Our populations, kind of region wide, Travis, Big Stone, uh, have basically been cut in half. Browns Valley went from a town of 1,100 to 589. However, because of the, you know, it took 26 years. But each year it got to a better place, and I think that's, that's what water management is. You try, to, you try to get it to a better state each day. And so now there's been uh, <laughs> the multi-million dollar uh, RV park investment along the lake. There's been new homes go up, uh, the desirability of tourism. And it's all starting to refuel our main streets. <laughs> Over the same time, we've lost both our uh, cafes. The municipal liquor store for many, many, many years lost money for three years in a row and it was sold. And it's like any small business on Main Street in these, in these rural areas. They need every dollar that used to be there. And uh, so I think it's a great opportunity. And the key, Danny mentioned, is uh, local implementation and local control for meeting compliance and getting in that range of, of uh, stewardship is, is going to get the, the whole area to a better place. Thanks for those comments. You guys are being the producer over here, being pretty quiet. Everything's okay with you guys? I can't make the price go to $5. <laughs> yes, sir. Larry Ripe on the permit. What happens if we don't comply with this buffer strap? You know, the uh, administrative penalty order is $500. The governor wanted to find you at $10,000. We agreed, uh, Director Jasky and, and and those of us agreed that it would only be $500 with the idea that we're hoping you'll comply, that you think 16 and a half feet along the public ditch you can live with and you can work with it, and that you uh, have children and grandchildren like I have, and you care about water quality. So is it $500 on what? $500 per farm? $500 per acre? $500 per farm unit? What? What's $500? The $500 fine is for the individual, the farm, the individual that's doing it. Um, I think it can be reapplied again. Bowser's history with fines, I think they've fined one or two individuals in the state of Minnesota in the last 10 years. I think it's one, but I might be wrong. It might be two, I think. So the idea is not, we took away any big fines, but the idea is that we'll work together to get it done. We don't want people to think, oh, the fine's only $500, so I'll just break it. That's not what we're trying to do. And Go I, ahead. And I'm Stand not, up, if you don't mind. And I'm not saying I don't I comply, but I just think it should be some compensation. Yep. And, Paul, I mean, and I mean, that, those are discussions that, we're going to have. That is the biggest thing that, yep. you know, we know this thing's going to happen, so make it workable. But you need to remember that these are public ditches that when they went through redetermination under current law, had to have 16 and a half feet. Now some of you are gonna say, yeah, but that wasn't being enforced. I understand that, but a law is a law. They were all gonna need to comply when they went through redetermination. They were. All we did was say that they need to do it now in the next three years, we're not gonna wait for redetermination. And that, the reason the governor agreed with that is because that's exactly what Paul Torkelson said when he sat at the testimony table and said, that's the bill. That was the legislative intent. We're speeding up what would have happened under current law. Can I just add a comment? Larry, good to see you. As a farmer, I'm going to say this to, to you all, that uh, most of the conservation programs to this point have been volunteer. There are those in St. Paul and in Washington who say, <laughs> These programs aren't working. Let's go to some mandatory type programs and none of us want to hear that, that say we, we have to, have to, have to, have to. And as Denny said, you know, the fine thing was put in place 
is kind of a little bit of a push, but you know, I, I hope we don't as a group say, well, I'm going to sit back and do nothing and just take a $500 fine. I think we as farmers, in a way, have to step up and show that we can voluntarily do some of these things with some compensation, but, but this could be a lot worse. And, and I think it's our chance to show the public that uh, we also want to have clean water and that um, we're going to do our part, make it fair with some compensation or tax breaks or whatever, but um, this could be worse and let's not, let's not abuse what's here now. That's my opinion. I think you're going to see in this session a big effort to come up with some compensation, some cost share program to help people pay for some of this implementation. You know, I, I think you're going to see that. We'll do you and then you, sir. Okay, Linda Barbara, Donald, Minnesota. I'm also president of the Boys to Sue Workshop Board. My concern here is, uh, one, farmers don't get enough credit for what they do. These farmers have been working darn hard to try to do what the watershed asks them to do. They're very compliant. Uh, they're very smart people. They're not trying to skip around and not put their buffers in. We've got some watershed laws that suck. They're bad. They were written for lawyers by lawyers. And we could spend a million bucks trying to figure them out. So that's where uh, the redetermination falls in place. So I, I, I'm tired of the farm groups being the ones that are attacked. I think the farmers are trying their darndest out here, and I think the governor should pat them on the back, not uh, chastise them and point the finger at one group of people. We're all in this problem together. And that means all the city folks, too, not just the farm people. Another thing is if we could write water laws that were clear and concise, instead of having to take them to court and spend millions and millions of dollars trying to understand what the heck they meant, then we maybe would have got some action done here. But that is legislative's problem, and that's what they need to do. We have water statutes right now that are so great that every time we as a watershed try to implement them, we end up in court. Now, how can we help farmers if we don't have the right, proper laws that we can do that? And what I see with the governor's buffer law was another one of those shady gray laws that are written to lawyers to make lawyers a lot of money and leave the rest of us in the lurch out here. So back off blaming the farmer, try to get them together, try to get everybody in this state together to solve the problem. Say, dear, in about 10 or 20 years, Backer's going to retire, and you'll be old enough then to run for the legislature. <laughs> 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 uh, sir, I think it was you, and then we'll get you, ma'am, next. Uh, Neil Bloom, Herman. Can you define public water? And what I mean, is, is a township ditch of public water or a county? You know, just define, because everything is, you've been saying is public water, public water. Just define what public Wait, water is considered. Two different things. You mentioned public waters, but I think you meant the public ditch kind of the public ditch, but also. Because public waters are, in current law, are, there is a map of public waters. And you probably know if on your farm you have public waters. That has a requirement of 50 feet. We're actually working with DNR, and we are anticipating DNR's maps are not going to necessarily require, i got to be careful on how I say this, some of you have public waters on private land. Um, I can think of actually our hunting land has an uh, enclosed pond on it that is actually on the map of public waters. Okay, that, public has a 50 foot, that has a 50 foot requirement. They're not necessarily, because they come up and down, you can't really define where the 50 feet would be. In regards to public ditches, they're defined in current law. They have a ditch authority that governs them. That is already in current law where they are. If you have a question of whether your ditch is public or private, that'll get found out. They're defined by current law. I'm sorry to say that, but that there's not a question of whether it's a public ditch or a private ditch. It is either in or out. And it's already defined in law, and it will be on the map. Now, I think there will be some legitimate discussions at a local level that there was. we don't agree with DNR on both sides of whether it really was a, a public waters and a public ditch, excuse me, and, and is the map done wrong. This map's gonna cover the whole state. It's gonna have some mistakes in it. And there's a comment period and when they put them out, there's a process in place for how that'll work. So yeah. Most of you know it because you're in the ditch authority. Yeah. You know, it's on your land or your neighbor's land, your tile's going into it or whatever. So you know. Well I was concerned about township ditches. 
Well, a but public they're ditch. Not, they're not a ditch authority, so well, you answered the question. Yeah, a public ditch can be on, on public or private property. I mean, there's one running along 28, like I think is it right over here. That's a public ditch, and it's on the road authority. A lot of them are on private. You know how they go. Ma'am, you were County Go ditches, ahead. judicial dishes are your public ditches. Yeah. County yeah. ditches. Yeah. Hi, I'm Janet from Big Stone County. Uh, we're obviously not all the, si the same size and shapes, and we don't all act the same when we do ditches. That's been totally disregarded in this one-size-fits-all scenario. We also have a county ditch running through us, which was redetermined, and we have 16 and a half feet grass on each side. That's fine. We have many grass waterways running through us taking our water and 47,000 other acres of water. My concern is my 1,200 acres is being asked to gradually shrink every year to put more and more buffers in for the 47,000 acres that have ditched waterways, or not waterways, but ditches running through them where their dirt runs into the ditch, through the culvert, into my waterway, and I am supposed to filter it all. What is being done about the 47,000 acres behind me? Why am I losing all the land? We gave the SWCDs $22 million to work with <laughs> private property owners to implement practices, <clears throat> and there's going to be a number of cost share programs uh, for them but to nobody work Nobody else with. is being made to do it, only well, the people who have water running through them. The only, I already told you what the buffer bill basically what it yes, does. And I, and I understand that you wish we would have, I don't want to speak for you, but there, there could be an argument that we wish we would have forced people to do more than the current law did. You know, this is a huge first step, a big step. I shouldn't call it a first step, but this is a huge thing that we did. We speeded up the implementation of uh, redetermination. That's a huge, huge thing. And I think we need to let that work its way through getting the SWCD money. You make a great point that there's spots where we should protect and put in permanent grass vegetation instead of what current practices are. The best people to help do that are the SWCDs and they're properly funded for the first time in my legislative career. But the only people that are being asked to do it are the people closest to the water. No, they'll work with people on private ditches and grass waterways and such. They're going to uh, work voluntarily in implementing additional practices. But they're not doing anything to slow down the water before it goes into these things. Well, we have to give to them an opportunity uh, to implement the law. You're saying in the past you think more could have been done. No, I'm saying, I'm saying that right now you're asking only the people with the ditches running through them and that are closest to where the water is entering into the ditches, which you mentioned, the little lakes, etc., etc. They're the only ones being asked to, to give up the land. They're the only ones being forced to give up the land. Well, yes, I didn't want to say that, but yes. Well, we've already had our 16 and a half feet in for many years when our ditch was redetermined 20 some years ago. That's not my beef. My beef is the fact that you want more and more and more and more and more we're being used like a water treatment plant for the 47,000 acres behind us. Well, we're here to listen to everybody, ma'am, and you make a good point. That's what I am concerned about. Todd, we're going to go around until everybody has a, a, a first chance to ask a question first. Sir. I'm Marvin Wilson from Polk County. I think we've had turbidity studies for years now. I don't hear the results, but I'm, I'm assuming they're improving. Does this bill come with goals? Or if we accomplish such and such, are there more rules that'll come down the pipe? It seems like somebody lays awake at night thinking about rules that they can uh, come out to rural America and say this is how it has to be. So does this bill have goals? that once we reach these goals, well, we're done with the bill, or at least it, it, it'll continue without more and more rules? I, I think that's kind of a follow-up to the gentleman back there. Um, could there be good and better record-keeping of what actually are we accomplishing? 
and I, I think that that's probably a shortfall in the fact that this was done uh, very uh, much developed at, at the end of session. Unfortunately, the governor didn't give us clear direction for a couple months, so we had to do it very quickly. But your point that we should have some evaluation going on so we know that it is working, and is there other things we could or should do? Those are valid points. Or even if it's needed. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, I mean, you can argue, sorry, a ditch goes like this. You dig a ditch, you put the land, you put the dirt on both sides and it slopes away. Even a landscaper can figure out how much value does the grass sloping away from that water protect that water. Sorry, I mean, you guys, maybe you don't want me to say that, but that's the blunt truth. But at the same point, 16 and a half feet isn't too wide. And the last thing we want is another picture of a combine sitting in a ditch because they didn't see the washout when they clipped the two rows closest to the ditch. So that's the My reality. Is, there should be rules that you can measure. So we put in a bill, and, we, and we've got turbidity studies, so we know what the waters are like downstream. If this bill doesn't improve on those things, what is the point? Well, that's a great point. I mean, that, 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 yeah, what would be our, some, some baseline numbers? Where are we starting from? Where are we headed to? And, and the MPCA is involved in the water quality part of it, and, and they would be the ones who would, would do these uh, baseline studies and, and whatever goals. And Danny is right, there are no goals in this current bill, and, and there probably should be in terms of what are we trying to accomplish compared to what we have today. How are the competitive studies, you know? The MPCA does those. And there is an MPCA individual here, and if you ask, want to know about your particular area, or no, but if you did, they can help you find that. I, I mean, those are good questions for probably 20, 30 years. And have we improved on those things? Certainly, in and some so, cases. Where, when is the point where enough is enough? What we tried to do was not have a blanket one size fits all. That's why we want the SWCDs to work with the local producers. So on the ground, when it, different spots are different, there are spots where a lake is going to pour over tomorrow or this spring because it was <coughs> haywire. And it could be because fathead minnows got in it and it turned to a muddy state. There's other ones that they've cleaned up by practices on the land where the producer has done some things to make it better. So there's not a one size fits all. Some spots, turbidity is getting a lot better. Mr. Johnson talked about Traverse Lake and how we changed that from when I was a kid to where it got really bad and now it's really good. You know, my Mississippi example. You, sir, uh, can go next. Did I? Yeah, yeah, you with the, yep, the hat. Uh, I Matt Christensen, Northwestern Polk County. Um, I believe as, as humans uh, and, and stewards of the land, I think we have a moral uh, obligation just to do the right thing and, and make this resource better than what it was and what it is when we leave. And, and I think the Buffer Initiative is a, is a good step forward in that direction. Well, thank you for your comment. Might have to talk loud so they can your way in the corner. Okay, uh, we have a lot of <coughs> probably more than most counties ditches lay them uh, protected water ditches that require 50 foot buffers, and I understand that there's no process to possibly get that narrowed down through negotiating other practices. Um, but there seems to be a lot of inaccuracies in. Uh, the labeling of some of the ditches, and now we're finding out that you know some basically cattail sluices that nobody knew were uh, part of this map, and also they're extending the ditches and going on to uh, shoreland ordinance rules, which requires a 50 foot buffer. Do you know what the process is going to be to make the corrections on the ones that absolutely make no sense? Well, I think your question about we did there's a uh, allowance for some things that instead of having to have a 50 foot blanket along this meandering stream, it's a minimum of 30 feet with alternative practices because it's folks know farm equipment doesn't necessarily follow a meander of a stream, so we might be able to utilize the reality of the equipment by having some alternative practices. You mentioned specifically, um, there will be some challenges in, in the law and interpretation. You can have a, 
public ditch and a public water to be the same body. It's our interpretation that if that's been being used as a ditch, it'll be governed as a ditch. If it's a meandering creek that really is a creek, but it serves as a ditch, it's probably public water. With that interpretation, we're using and we're working with the agency, and we think and our hope is that those ones that fall under both jurisdictions, and that might be what you're talking about, that common sense will dictate. If it looks like a ditch and has been used as a ditch, it's a ditch. If it looks like a stream and it's being used as a stream, it's a stream. And a lot of these, uh, a lot of these are at the top of the watershed where they're required a 50 foot buffer. And then you get where a lot more acres are coming into it, and then those areas are often required a 16 and a half foot buffer. That's you know, kind of a, because of the labeled protective waters, His point is, one size doesn't fit all very well at all. And that's why we're trying to get it more at the local level. And there are going to be specific challenges like that. Thank you for bringing it up. That's a great point of the challenges that we have. You know, and we address some of it with that alternative practice issue. Yeah, sir. Uh, Neil Grant, Big Stone County. Uh, where do we go with our challenges to this? Is when the maps come out, we don't agree with them. We go to the Soil and Water Conservation District? Or? Do you know the process when they come out? There's going to be a comment process. Um, so, you go, starting at the local level, your soil and water conservation district is where the maps are going to go first because the DNR is going to send them out and ask them for any input on what local waterways should be added, what shouldn't be added. So, they are going to have, they're supposed to have that process um, as before the final maps come out. So, that would be the best place to start. But I'm anticipating there will be, at the DNR level, a public comment period. And depending on how that goes, I can't really speak to what the process will look like after that. But starting at the local soil water conservation district is a great place to air any concerns uh, one way or the other. And I'd like to add, add to that, that is exactly why we put local control in it. So when the maps come out, right now they're supposed to come out in July roughly. It is important for you to work with the um, local soil water conservation districts to, sit, to make sure that it's mapped correctly if you have any concerns and so forth. So it is important for the landowner to go in and look at that map. Are they going to tell us when, they're, when they got them to show us or are they going to mail us something? I would assume so. They've done that with, um, and I can only speak with Big Stone. I know. Um, I met with them, what was it, three months ago we met in Orphanville? And that was their, their intent is to inform you. Um, and I don't see why the other ones want it. They want feedback. That's one of the reasons that um, we gave that local control because there's the more transparency. Because we did not want a DNR comment. You know, and we all do at our local district level, Jeff and Paul and I do, do what we call email updates and put, put the word out in our local paper and stuff. That'll be an effort I know in my own district, yeah. and I'm assuming these guys too will want to let, as this develops and DNR says, you know what, we're sending them out to the SWCDs in Big Stone and Traverse County this week. Jeff can do an email update that says, hey guys and gals, uh, they're coming to the SWCDs uh, in the next couple weeks. And so, you know, and I'm assuming they're going to be electronic to where people will be able to either, you'll have a choice, you can go in or, or, or look at it if, if your computer want to do that in. Did you give the DNR any guidelines for the prairie potholes, how to decide 50 feet and where it starts, ordinary high water mark, the bull mark? Are you talking about public waters that are... Well, they're wetlands. Is the wetland a public water? Well, you can go on a map and see what are public waters, and I would recommend you do that, because if it's public waters, it's treated differently than the... I don't know all the terminology, the swamp buster and all that stuff, what you have to do with wetlands, but public water wetlands are treated differently 
and I know they're working on where some of them are what I think of as a cattail slough, and you might farm them one year and five years later it's so big. That's not going to have their, my understanding is their interpretation, they don't intend to try and define where a 50 foot buffer is going to go around that because you and I probably know that you can't practically do that. Is it 1989 or is it 1991? Yes, that's what I was wondering if you gave them any guidelines or just those aren't part of the bill normally? The intent yeah. here is to deal with water that moves, not necessarily potholes that the water sits there or wetland that sits there. Okay. Uh, hey, I'm Fulton County. I'd like to invite Mr. Sacker up to our someday and view some of the work we've been doing as far as we've been installing buffers for about eight years on our ditches that we're working and see how we've let the fix our ditches and I think it's something that can take back to <coughs> legislature or whatever. Most of our grass filter strips run away from the ditch and into a culvert with a trap on it so it's metered and, and and takes the silt out of the water and leaves it on the field. Uh, I've got a feeling about buffer strips that I don't believe in because I think it caused more phosphorus and phosphates in the, in the water than they do good. And more of a, of a dirt, a silt kit stopper, so the way ours are built. I just like to have it come up. Dan, what county are you again? Wilkin. Wilkin, okay, yeah, cool. So. And th there is some interesting study, um, um, John emailed it to me from Big Stone, um, University of Manitoba, right? Yeah, um, showing that phosphate levels um, increase because of the natural vegetation yeah. and so forth. Um, emailed it to me this weekend and got, haven't gone through it all, but what I've gone through has been um, quite an eye-opener. The Canadians have been ahead of us on this stuff here too, so, uh, but, I will do that. Well, and, that, and your point about the alternative practices and getting the SWCDs to work with the producers to do common sense stuff. That's that's what happens when you have a, guys like these guys, Representative Torkelson involved in the bill, right in the bill. They actually are real farmers out on the ground doing it, and he understands it, and that's why there is a fair amount of common sense. Are there challenges? Yeah, so the definition of some of the stuff, but I think it'll... We'll, we use a lot of... Uh, Lassard Sands money or whatever, uh, uh, clean water money uh, to accent rebuilding the ditches for the farmers. Total cooperation. We never get any negatives about the buffer or anything. In fact, it's uh, getting deal where they almost, well, now they know they have to do it, so we're doing it for them. And that's the dedicated sales tax that passed in 2008 yeah. that's used for habitat improvements in Minnesota. Sir, was it your hand up? Yeah. Uh, Blaine Hill, city manager in Morris. Uh, I guess my question for you is, what is your support for uh, infrastructure costs for unfunded mandates that come from MPCA? And I'll, I'll start by saying we're not fighting the mandates that are coming from MPCA. We actually, I think, are pretty environmentally conscious in Morris and know and understand what the quality of the water means to the people in, in our area. We have a former state park. Uh, that got turned over to the city that we're actually using and, and making improvements to. But there's two issues with regards to mandates. One is that we recently got picked up to have to get a permit to uh, <coughs> discharge our stormwater, which comes off the city, into the Pomni Fair River. So we hired an engineering firm to do the study in order to apply for the permit. The second thing, though, and the most important thing is that uh, we are required to meet a chloride uh, mandate from MPCA. We know and understand exactly where it's coming from. Uh, we actually had a couple college students from the university that did a study on water softening systems in the community and figured out all the salt that people are putting into their water softeners goes through our sanitary sewer system to our pond system and eventually goes into the Pomni Terre River. So the solution we figured out was building a new water treatment plant <coughs> to the tune of about $14 million. We have a water treatment plant. Actually, the last payment on the, the recent update to it is going to be in 2019. So my question is, what is your support for infrastructure costs for cities trying to meet these mandates? 
especially in, in a city like Morris where 30% of the property is tax exempt and the tax base doesn't actually support the, the normal services that we provide. So we are subsidized through local government aid to the tune of about 60% of our budget. So Blaine, thank you. And I think you'll see the governor laid out an aggressive uh, wastewater treatment PFA agenda. <laughs> Uh, the Republicans will be fully supportive of that kind of an investment in infrastructure going out to greater Minnesota to help those cities deal with those improvements. We have held MPCA's feet to the fire in Representative Fabian's Bill 616 and 617 last year that said, you know what, you want um, uh, Breckenridge to lower their phosphate level by X amount, whatever it was, and spend Y amount. 16 million or whatever the number was, and they're going to save how much phosphates and what's going to be the effect on the Red River. And at the same time, Wapaton requirements are completely different. And oh, by the way, they just got a little short bridge and you're there. Um, and so we pushed very, very hard. The governor went along with some of what we wanted to do, exactly what you're talking about. How about if we know, we understand it'd be a great idea to spend this $20 million. Is that the best way to do it? Or should we maybe sit down and talk to Wapiton and what can we do kind of together that might make more sense? They're not even on step one. We're already on step four. You're making a great just, point. Just one quick point on that is I understand all that and, and we pretty much gave up on you know the, the ins and outs because there's all kinds of information about what do the studies say? Is this actually going to solve some of the problems in the river. But the money that was put into the governor's bonding bill, we actually have a, a bill that was dropped in last year for $7 million. We actually upped it to about $11.5 million because the cost of our plan went up. But that money that's going to the PFA is not grant money. They have a cap on grants. It's loan money. That doesn't do us any good. We can borrow money to build. What we need to do is we need to get grants or bonding money from the state to pay for these facilities that are going to solve the water problem. We know exactly where it's coming from. We get that salt out of the system, and that's going to help the Pondy Fair River. But we can't afford to build a plant when we already have one. It's like buying a car when you already have a car. And, and the old one will get torn down before the last payment on it is made, which is a pretty sad thing for a small community. And, um, and I've been working with the city of Morris on that. First of all, I am dropping a bill saying that if MPCA has a, um, a, an additional burden, because what, in my opinion, what MPCA is doing is saying, hey, you know, Morris, Breckenridge is another example. They've been going along, doing what they've been required to do. Now we're putting an additional burden on them. So one bill that I'm dropping is, if there is a requirement that the state, and Blaine, you know I've talked about it, that the state should come up and help with that. Also, um, I talked to John Stein that um, uh, to look at with uh, more grant money instead of just loan money because of the situation. So um, at the same time, Danny is aware of it, and he needs to hear from you too on that. So if, if we're going to put requirements on from the state, then A, the state needs to come and help put the bill, instead of putting these undue burden on our local um, governments, and, and, and like Paul talked about, with compensation with the bus or strips too. Was it there somebody, was it you, sir? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you guys have been all of this is the bumper law as it exists now as a step in the Can right Can you direction. share us your name? Oh yeah, Alex Galt, Seeds County Resident. Okay. Uh, so you can acknowledge that it's a step in the right direction, I guess which would imply that it's not going to solve the problem folks are really sticking their neck out to solve. So that would mean if we keep moving in the right direction, that would be turning around and walking upstream on the private land. Um, we acknowledge that the uh, um, voluntary programs, which I'm a huge fan of, haven't necessarily worked, and that's why we're getting to the point where we're trying to enforce laws that have been on the books for a long time. So what are you guys' thoughts? Where do we go once we get things in, you know in place the way they should be right now and then the problem's still there do we you know turn around upstream and try to solve that problem or do we walk away well I'll just comment a second um, 
this buffer bill addresses overland water movement. It, it doesn't address pile water drainage. And you probably know, most farmers have heard about this lawsuit down in Iowa. The Des Moines city is suing three watersheds up the uh, Des Moines River, Raccoon River. And they're trying to get the pile drainage declared as a point source of pollution. Uh, if that happens, it, it, it's a game changer over the whole country in terms of, of regulating pile drainage. So I would say that, that this bill is going to address phosphorus more than nitrogen. And nitrogen pollution is, is the big thing that people are worried about in terms of well, your parts per million and the nitrogen going down in the hypoxia zone in, in the Gulf. That's the next step from those that want to increase and ramp up these types of these types of measures. So, uh, as far as what's going to happen next, you know, I don't know. But uh, this is a good step, and hopefully we can, you know, with some with some guidelines, see some results that uh, pay dividends, and and maybe we want to take those next steps. But that remains to be seen. Who's in power in five or ten years? Um, Becky Young, Stevens County Coordinator. In, in terms of the buffer strip and the implementation of this, if we take land out of production from producers, it doesn't have an assessed value for egg land anymore. How does the county handle that in terms of assessment and when does that can be triggered? It's done differently. Different counties deal with it differently across the state. Paul mentioned that there's some efforts to say maybe we should make counties uh, say that land has to be treated differently tax-wise. If I'm not mistaken, some people have talked about maybe it should automatically, some have said this, we should automatically tax it at only half the rate if it was production ag or something. So it's done differently in different states, at different counties. And I'm just concerned about it because I think it's a real unintended consequence of this bill because the county then is going to lose funding and we're already under a position where we're losing the county program aid. So you're going to squeeze this. I mean, I, I feel like the producer should have to pay at that egg value anymore because they're not using it for egg production. But you're gonna, we're going to lose funding at the county level, and so really it's an unfunded mandate as you come full circle. You're not going to lose funding. There's going to be a shift in who pays right. the taxes, yes. what it is. You're still going to levy X amount of dollars, and yeah. how that money is collected is just going to shift. It is, but I'm just saying, you know, we're already losing, we're losing the county program aid because in the Stevens County specifically, we lost 85% since 2005 because of the high egg value land that's driving that formula. So we're shifting, we're shifting the pool again. I understand that, but it really ultimately is. There's, we're going to lose funding, and we're losing it from both sides. We're losing because the egg value is going up, and then we're going to take the plan out of production. So it really narrows that pool. And the counties have a new plan to address that situation. It costs about like eighty million dollars of biennium, and it's going to be brought forward to try to rectify what you're talking about. The, yeah. the higher land values cause a drop in your CPAs. So yeah, we're aware of that. Hopefully, some changes can be. Yes, uh, Richard is my name. I'm from uh, Hancock, Minnesota. And uh, we talked about these uh, buffer strips. Well, it seems to me that a, a rational person would say uh, there's got to be a justifiable need to do this. And it, looks, it, it seems to me like we should have some kind of a baseline water samples of these rivers and lakes or whatever. And then if you put these buffer strips in, then we should go back and check those those water quality parameters. And if there is no improvement, then, and I know it's almost impossible, but if there's no improvement, then the buffer should not be mandated anymore. Right? You know, Richard, Isn't that rational? Um, I will have to say, I'm so glad that you're the third or fourth person to say that, because that makes so much, Paul and I just said, you know, as this was developed, we need to have that, <laughs> absolutely. Otherwise, we look really, really stupid if we say, yeah, we made you do it, and nobody even thought, maybe you should check and see what the results of what you're doing. Great point. Okay, Johnson, you can roll. You're the first one to get two. <laughs> the uh, gentleman who just mentioned the baseline data. I know Lake Travers has all that baseline data, the beginning water quality, ending water quality, tributaries, Third Big Stone Lake has it. They're both headwater lakes, Red River, Mississippi. And so rather than, as this thing progresses, 
there shouldn't be a need for another study and a, and a, and a bunch of money thrown at, at measuring something that's already been measured. And then, uh, you know, by and large, most of the landowners do, do, a, do the right thing. But like, like a bad apple, only, only take, uh, one bad apple spoils a bunch. So if you, everyone has to have, I think, the intent of this buffer strip law is that it establishes a standard of care, a baseline standard of care that's both effective and acceptable. And then just chemically speaking, uh, phosphorus has to have sediment to reach, it, it, sediment is the carrying uh, property, it's the bus that carries phosphorus. And then once it gets phosphorus, the nitrogen attaches itself to that as well. And that's where you get judged. So if you control sediment, you really take care of a lot of the issues. So, um, you know, I think this is a great discussion today, and I, I think a lot of good points have been brought up. Everybody wants to go eat lunch? Anybody who hasn't asked a question yet? Make sure um, the sign-up thing is going around, so we want to know who came so we can stay up in touch with you. It is going around, so just FYI. I'm Margaret from uh, Stevens County, and one topic that hasn't been raised today that really concerns me a lot. It's not something that is obvious every day, but um, we are, you know, minute by minute, day by day, responsible for climate change. Putting too much CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And since you guys are here today, I want to express my disappointment um, from last year's GOP energy omnibus bill that did a lot, I think, to weaken Minnesota's stance toward limiting climate change. Uh, in the past, I've been really proud of Minnesota because we had strong renewable energy mandates and we have lots of small businesses that are working in greater Minnesota to do things like uh, build solar panels. And this bill did lots of things that I think were a giant step backwards. It eliminated the conservation incentive program that saved rate payers six uh, billion dollars. We didn't dollars. eliminate that program. There may have been a proposal at one time that did not get eliminated. Okay, well how about getting rid of uh, the net metering standards so that people who have wind and solar panels on their land can uh, get a fair price for the energy that they feed back into the grid? How about the mandate or the uh, incentives for people to install Minnesota-made solar panels? Things like that. And I really think that Minnesota needs to be progressive and do everything we can to limit. Uh, a couple, couple of things. Just we never eliminated the Minnesota made. There was a discussion. I can just tell you the federal politics that put that in place to make sure that that place on the Iron Range was built in the panels instead of letting a competitive process when we have some great ones that are a lot more cost effective and would make solar panels less expensive makes sense. We could agree to disagree on that. Your thing about net metering is we had a small co-op come forward from, I'm trying to remember where was it, uh, that said, if we continue on the pace we are on, it's gonna go upside down. You are making people, you know how net metering I works. I do know how you net pay metering the, works. You get paid the retail rate to put it back on the grid. And every time you do that, your neighbor's electric rate goes up. And that's the only way it works. Our thoughts are maybe you should let the competitive process work, work its way through. And if I could just real quickly, on the global warming part, here's my deal, what I tell with my fellow colleagues, Republicans, and someone that debate whether global warming is happening or not. I said, you know, I really don't want to have that debate. I came from the nursery industry. White birch are growing where they didn't used to and they can't grow where they did. We don't have black spruce where we used to have them anymore. And the moose is not doing so well in places. I don't really care about arguing about whether global warming is happening or not, but I know that we don't have moose where we used to have. I can remember fox hunting in Breckenridge and seeing these great big tracks on the land and I thought, what in the world is this? Somebody said, well, that's actually six moose went through here yesterday. I'm sorry, we don't have that happening, I mean, other than the one that got hit by the car in Wheaton last year. <laughs> Strange. But, but yeah, your point is well made. But yes, we have to so realize, do you know that the electoral rates in Minnesota generally have
have doubled in the last 10 years. Well, there are good reasons that, that energy should be more expensive because you make great, great it's, a, it's a dirty process right now. At, at well, it's gotten a lot cleaner. By, well, it's gotten cleaner, but it should get a lot more cleaner. And so I'd like to ask you gentlemen then, in the future uh, legislative session, so probably two years from now, what sorts of, of uh, proposals will you have for uh, meeting the challenges of climate change? I would just um, discuss a couple points you've made. Minnesota is looked at as a, as a national leader in renewable energy. Um, we set the net price of solar last year at 14 cents a kilowatt hour. And we have an untold number of community solar gardens coming in now because of that high price of solar. So to say that we are, you know, really falling back in terms of renewables, I would, I would challenge that. Another, the last point I would make is that uh, the president has come with a clean power plan, and there's some real stringent requirements for the states. North Dakota has to really watch its whole generation. Minnesota can meet those standards by doing nothing different than we are today. Not many states can say that. With our SIP programs, which have not gone away, and all the other renewable initiatives of wind and solar, we can meet those standards by not changing anything by what we're doing today. So I, I think Minnesota is in the forefront of the uh, energy situation. I would argue that we're not doing enough. And I think that in 100 years, our grandchildren are going to be really mad at the lackadaisical attitudes that we've had. Hi, Eric Kyle said, Stevens County resident. Um, so I just want to point out, uh, Representative McNamara, you just said that um, uh, electricity prices had uh, gone up pretty exponentially um, in the recent years. Um, but, and you're also talking about how um, net metering causes our neighbors' electricity rates to go up. And I don't really, uh, to me, I, I don't necessarily agree with that viewpoint. Um, because as Minnesotans, we are exporting $18 billion outside of our state for energy every year. So to me, I'd prefer to be uh, you know, paying my neighbor down the road for electricity rather than a uh, lignite coal plant in North Dakota. And um, you know, I think that uh, continuing to invest in renewable energy um, is good for Minnesota ratepayers. I mean, you wouldn't have XL Energy decommissioning the Sherco coal plant and replacing it with uh, uh, 1,200 megawatts of solar um, by 2026 if it wasn't going to be cost effective for them and uh, be able to make them money. So I, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I don't necessarily agree with you saying that um, net metering and renewable energy is uh, going to continue to uh, raise electricity rates um, because we have uh, XL CEO saying that um, wind and solar are either, or, here, the CEO is saying unsubsidized uh, that wind and solar are cost competitive or by far cheaper um, than coal and even natural gas at this point. The only, the only thing I would add quickly is that uh, we can have all the solar and wind that we want, but what happens on that still summer night when the sun goes down, there's no wind blowing, and you want to have your air conditioner running? We have to have base load power to back up all those systems. Can I respond to that? Yes. Um, so with uh, recent developments in energy storage, storage technology, um, this, uh, analysts are predicting that solar or that distributed solar and wind can be delivered at around two cents a kilowatt hour with the completion of the Tesla batter, battery factory. So by and large, this is, uh, this is more about utilities protecting their business model rather than saving ratepayers money on electricity. Somebody else has their hand. Yeah, Mick Miller from Morris. Um, I, just, I just don't want to lose focus here. Um, I think we all like to do business locally and, and, and lean on our neighbors, you know, when, when the time is, is right. But um, I'm not sure what was better. The ladies comments up front or the commercial a few years ago during the Super Bowl about, you know, and, God, and then God made a farmer. So I think all these folks, I'm not a farmer. I think all these folks that are farming in the room are doing more and more with less every year. So I just, I think it's, it's unfair to set expectations or create penalties that really are for the benefit of all Minnesotans. We don't have coal, we don't have oil, we don't have natural gas. So what we do have is agriculture, and that's why we're here today. 
That's why we're in Chicago. That's why they have a fireball. So I think that's really the focus is just to remember that the reason we're in rural or west central Minnesota today is because of farming. So just re it's, it's just good for the legislature to remember that. When creating rules or wanting to make improvements, just don't penalize the guys that are, that are creating this. Uh, or, or, or creating the economic development, I think it's really everybody's responsibility, not just the guys that own the land and run the tractors and, and bring the commodities to town. So, yeah, great point. Great Talk point. about being in the. <laughs> as far as being in the breadbasket, I remember, I think it was 2012 when we had the bumper crop we were all so proud of. And uh, in the Wheaton Dumont area, was the top area in the nation for production. It's a pretty cool place to be a farmer. Yeah, it is. It's a great point. You know, we're getting close to when we wanted to wrap up and honor people's comments, but if you haven't spoke yet, we've got time for a few more questions. Maybe the folks that think they're going to want to ask their question, we can see how many hands pop up that haven't asked their question yet. If you've asked one, you can come up and ask us individually. But how many people that haven't asked a question yet? So we've got one, two, uh, three here, we get four maybe. So why, why don't we let all four of them, and then we'll have a little time for you to come up and, and let us uh, we can personally address some thoughts. Why don't we, we'll just work from front to back for the four people that raise their hand. I'm uh, Barry Nelson, a farmer in Hancock, Minnesota here. I got irrigation, and I got neighbors that got livestock. One, a big thing that's bothering me is Minnesota Pollution Control and the DNR grabbing so much power against our consumption of water. And, they, and I don't believe that they use good science on what is a lot of water. In Jeff District alone, one inch of rain is 61 billion gallons of water. That's 8 million semi-trucks of water. And, the, and I'm hearing stories about hog farms being limited to 1 million gallons a year. Where's the science behind whether or not this is bad? I've been irrigating, our farm has been irrigating for 40 years, since the middle 70s, and every year our aquifers are at the top and I can go to some of the same wells and I can touch the water table at the top of that well if I were to pull my pump out. It's, it's not a, as big a deal as everybody says, oh we're using more water, the ethanol plants are using too much water. Well it doesn't leave the planet, it doesn't go to Mars when they're done with it. We've got to use good science with some of this stuff. When I, when I, and I guess I want to say we have elected officials here that should be in charge of our operations, our, our laws, and our businesses, not the DNR, not Minnesota Pollution Control. They can advise them on what should make our laws, but I think these gentlemen right here are the ones that should make our laws for us. Good comment. Thank you. Uh, Austin Tipper from Stevens County. Um, last year, the MCPA uh, Citizen Review Board was gutted, basically, and that's a way for us out here to, as citizens to actually uh, impact the climate and make sure large ag um, doesn't run wild. It's a protection for us on smaller farms and things like that. Uh, I wonder what your guys' opinions on that, and if you have any plans to reinstate that or give them power back. You know the legislature in a bipartisan way and Governor Dayton signed a bill that eliminated uh, the Citizens Board. That was done bipartisanly and the governor signed that bill. We have a nation leading public input process today where citizenry can weigh in. We have public comment period that's second to none in the nation and we're very proud of that and uh, that duplicative process that we used to have and really didn't work that had citizens uh, with control over unelected folks, control over people's lives was probably, uh, we used to have boards like that as the governor himself said, we used to have boards like that in other agencies. We got rid of them in the 80s. That's a quote from the governor. Thank you for your point. Sure. Yeah, you can oh, okay. Um, You're okay. I just want to follow up on a couple of comments. Oh, no. and, being, and being in Minnesota. And your name is? I'm Troy from Morris. Okay. Um, and so, uh, being a Minnesotan, it's hard to say anything that disappoints you, but I want to echo some of the other comments that, that, that were made, and knowing that you're going to get the follow-up to whatever, anything, has been, anything else that's been said. I would also just echo the disappointment in, in, in that we shut down 50 years of the MPCA Citizens Board, and basically Governor Dayton didn't want that shut down, so I feel like your comments are disingenuous, disingenuous 
about the spirit that Governor Dayton had in mind. Basically, that was something you helped shut down after 50 years, 48 years of, of oversight. And we could talk about that at length. It was disappointing. I would also say it's disappointing as a father. I'm trying to teach my son about science. When the Republicans continue to basically misrepresent science, 3M, Best Buy, General Mills, the Department of Defense, U.S. Department of Agriculture, the CIA, NASA, NOAA, I could go on, national insurance companies basically accept man-made climate change and that we have to do something. I'm, we, we are not just economic man. I might be the rube in the room who pays otter tail power more money each month for clean electricity. I might be the idiot, but I'm trying to teach my son something, right? And I want him to be science literate. So when you say things like, well, I, don't, I'm, I guess I'm not really sure if it's the science or not, I don't want to debate that, there is no debate. So it frustrates me that our, it makes rural citizens look stupid when you say things like that. R rural citizens are not, right? And the third is, that frustrates, that, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, the, third, the third point, right, is if you measure it, if you care about it, you measure it and you manage it. And so lots of conversation here today about how are we going to basically know if there's a problem or do we have, are we actually cracking the code? Yeah, we're going to have to measure it, we're going to have to manage it. And I know what you guys are going to say, which is, well, what do you like, Troy? You like more taxes? You want more regulation? You want more? What I believe in is if that public and private partnership, we shouldn't be penalizing farmers. Sure, of course not. But if there's, if I feel bad for your community, Chairman, and I'm so glad you guys are here today. Thank you for being out here. But, and I feel bad for Hastings and that you're going to have to do a water treatment plant. But where do you think the nitrate is coming from? And this isn't about blaming. It's can we work together to fix the problem? Well, Troy, a couple of things. Um, thank you for being aware that we have an unbelievable problem in Hastings that's nitrate related. And then we've done a fantastic job on the Mississippi River of cleaning it up. I acknowledge that, I think, publicly, the first thing, that that's a challenge we have in Hastings and we need to work to make it better. Um, but you never heard me say that I don't believe in global warming. Mm -hmm. You heard me say that I tell my colleagues, I don't want to have that argument. But if we are nation leading in renewable energy, which we are, by not doing stupid stuff and making some iron range make the panels instead of competitive, where we'd actually get more As a solar. former iron ranger, I object to basically, if you're going to make those arguments, you, the citizen board basically taking that away. Detroit, it, it helped, I didn't interrupt it, you. Hang on. It helped big mining and big egg. And it helped big mining and big egg. And we're all each other's keeper. So to, to pretend for a moment that farming isn't subsidized or all kinds of businesses aren't subsidized or high-tech semiconductor industries, which I work in, aren't subsidized, belies the fact that we're trying to get business all over the state, including on the iron race, and you're not a ranger. Well, first of all, I understand that you want to support the fact that we made that solar panel help the iron range community instead of helping one that might have came from an adjoining state that would have been more cost effective for people to have. I understand you support that. I don't think that's a good idea. They won, it's in law. But you characterize me as being somebody who says global warming is going to happen. That is absolutely wrong, Republican. sir. Sir, you said I. You didn't say Republican. I agree with you that some Republicans want to say that. Don't come here. The majority. You know what? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Ma'am. Carol Johnson from Travis Collins, supervisor on the SWCB. And uh, we just had a meeting, a side of meeting, and there we were talking also about the quality of, you know, the soils. Did we 
get everybody. Oh, you had your hand up, sir. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. We'll go with this. Matt Solomsa, student soil and water. Um, I guess working locally for the last 10 plus years, you know, we work with a lot of producers, and I would say the majority, if not all, producers do something <coughs> conservation minded. You know, we're, you know, a lot of this onus is going to go on soil and water, so we hear soil and water will do this, soil and water is going to do that. You know, we're kind of in the dark like you guys. There's supposed to be a map coming out in July. There's supposed to be a map coming out about now where we could actually look at it and see what's what's what. We haven't seen that yet. Um, but you know, come into our office. We'll help you what we can. You know, we're talking about getting compensated. There's lots of programs, CRP. Um, there's going to be a CREP sign up. You know, if you're going to have to do this, you know, we want to get you some cost share. So I guess I just like to applaud all the producers. I mean, everybody tries to do the right thing. I think. Come local and we'll, we'll, help, we'll try and help you out as best we can. Thanks for those comments. Steve Fultz, Steve Tong. I just want to touch something on this global warming. Uh, you know, when they first started talking about that the global warming, people predicted a whole bunch of things, disasters that were going to happen before mm -hmm. now. And when the time came, none of those things happened. No, global warming, there's still an argument about global warming. You don't think so, but I do, and, and a lot of people do. And as far as accepting this global warming thing and even all the solutions that the global warming people talk about, they admit themselves that they have a minute difference on the world as to what's going to happen with us if we follow all these things. So I, I don't think you want to accept the idea that global warming is going to destroy us. And, that, that's something that we have to be careful about, whether we're going to just dive into this and destroy our economy when the world economy isn't worried about that. You know, they talk about things that the United Nations are going to change, but China and all these other countries aren't changing what they're doing. If we're going to pay for all this supposedly global warming thing in America and destroy our economy by doing it, it's going to be a real effect on our country that's going to be a lot worse for our kids 100 years from now than what an equal warming is going to do. I'm Diane Rademacher. I'm with the Upper Minnesota River Watershed District. And I just wanted to explain the map. The map is actually <coughs> online. You go to DNR's website, and all you have to type in is buffer map, and it'll take you to the page. Click on the link. You can zoom into your farm. It'll tell you exactly what buffers are needed, where they're needed. So it is out there. The first version is out there. It's online. Ma'am, is that showing private ditches as well? I mean, this just got changed last week. No, no private ditches. No private ditches on that map. And I'm not sure it's available yet in every town. It's on the web, but it's nothing new. There's nothing changed. I can show you those exact same maps in my office. They've been there forever. There's nothing new on but there are some things that folks can see on the line yeah, now, but it's not, it's not what they're supposed to deliver in J July. Right. The reality is now that they're not delivering private ditches, they're trying to deliver them in July. Those folks that are working on the ground know a lot of those maps are actually paper copies in the back of a county office somewhere. They wouldn't have been that been able to deliver them by July. No way. Um, most and of them in Big Stone County all private the uh, the Private ditches, I'm talking about. Yep, there is no private ditches that are being involved in this. Correct, but the private ditches, when the governor was going to say they were going to be available in July, they were a lot of paper copies and it wouldn't have been practical. Correct, correct. And Absolutely. I probably just confused people when I said So now the public waters are on there and the county drainage systems for Big Stone County, everything is on there. Yep. All the county drainage systems and the public waters are on the map. Same so stuff. I think what we'll do is just offer Jeff and Paul both a chance to say thank you uh, for coming. I appreciate you coming out. Uh, and hearing the diverse dialogue, um, go ahead and fall, and then, you know, we're in Jeff's district, we'll let him go. Last. Yeah, just, uh, again, thanks for coming. Uh, good, it's back and forth discussion. And if some things we can agree to disagree, but, uh, again, watch the maps. And I would say all farmers should check the maps. Uh, these public water inventories were first put out in the 70s and updated in the 80s, so they're they're fairly old if the DNR doesn't change anything. But when those maps come out for next July, we should all check them to make sure there are no surprises on there. And if there are, then there's this appeal process to challenge that. 
and hopefully get a result. So uh, thank you much. First of all, thanks for coming. Um, what's really important to me, obviously, not everybody got to talk, so if you need to get a hold of me with other issues, I receive, um, you can email me. My email address is rep, R-E-P dot Jeff dot Backer at house dot M-M. Um, if you want to talk to me, my cell number is 701-361-1909. Again, 701-361-1909. So we appreciate you coming out. Um, and um, if there's other things that we need to be aware of, just let me know. And that's what we're here for. So thank you. Thank you.